Today we'll finally finish some properties of the integral, and we'll start with something that we already know that was introduced before, and that is if f of x is greater than or equal to zero for all x in an interval, then the integral is going to have a result greater than zero. So what this means graphically, so if we have a nice little curve like this, and from a to b it is positive that just means that the area here is going to be positive and i introduced this only because this next property sort of has to do with the same type of picture but instead of y equals zero being the function that it's greater than we have that if f of x is greater or equal to another function g of x, then the area of f of x, or the integral of f of x, is going to be greater or equal than the integral of g of x. Now what this means, if we have a nice little graph here, we have two functions. So I'm going to draw this very carefully. I want this one to creep up like this, and I want my second function to creep like this. So the top, or the white function, will be f of x, and the pink function will be g of x, and what we'll do is we'll say, okay, all the spots where f of x is greater or equal to g of x. So this will be our a here, and this will be our b here. And what it's saying is that the area under f of x, which is all this white space here, is going to be greater than the area of g of x. So we see here that there is clearly more white than pink, so the area of f of x is greater than the area of g of x from a to b. Now clearly if we start moving over and shift a to the left a little bit, well, then we can no longer make this new claim because in this circumstance we have a little bit more area for pink than we do for white here. So what we really don't want to do is put that into our problem because then we're not able to make a definite result or property of integrals. So these things are kind of important. So for instance, if I were to say, okay, take the integral from, uh, let's do 2 to 3 of x squared plus 1, then what if I take the integral from 2 to 3 of x squared plus 9? which is going to be greater in terms of area? And the answer is this one will be greater because x squared plus 9 is always going to be greater than x squared plus 1. So the area of x squared plus 9 underneath the same points is going to be greater than the area underneath x squared plus 1 in the same interval. What's really important here is this concept. If we have two numbers, little m and big M, and f of x is between them in some interval, then the area underneath the curve is going to be between two rectangles, one whose height is determined by little m, and one whose height is determined by big M. So if we draw a picture here, and we have a nice function, as always. I should draw a little bit more curvy. So it's going to look like this. And our interval here is going to be from A to B. So what this says, and basically how we figure out what to do here, is we find the lowest point on the interval, and we call that little m, and then we find the highest point on the interval, and we call this 
big M. Now, if we take the area of little m, we know this will be less than the area of the curve here, which we'll do in light blue. But the area of the curve, in fact, I should extend this further down to the bottom, but the area of the curve is going to be less than the area of the box containing big M. So it is kind of like a, it's not necessarily like a squeeze function, but it sort of is, because when you think about this, m times b minus a is actually the integral from a to b of m. So we take the integral of all three, and we find that this relation still holds. So let's do an example here. I have the function e to the negative x squared, and I'm claiming that between 1 and 2, the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the negative x squared is going to be greater than 1 over e to the 4, but less than 1 over e. So when we take a look at the graph here, you can see that f of 1 is going to be a max and f of 2 is going to be a minimum. So what we'll do is we'll calculate this. We'll say, okay, f of 1 is equal to e to the negative 1 squared, which is e to the negative 1, which we can rewrite as 1 over e. And f of 2 is going to be e to the negative 2 all squared, which is e to the negative 4, which is also 1 over e to the 4. So these are the upper and lower bounds. So if we do a little inequality here, we know that 1 over e to the 4 is going to be less than e to the negative x squared, which is going to be less than or equal to 1 over e. But now what we have to do is we have to take the integral of them all. So we do this, and then we find that, well, what's really happening here is on the left and the right we have a constant. So we have to multiply by b minus a, but b minus a is just 2 minus 1, which is 1. So when we multiply the left and the right by 1 here, we just get 1 over e to the 4 is going to be less than or equal to the integral of e to the negative x squared dx, because it's an integral, which will be less than or equal to 1 over e. So we have proven that this is true. So that wasn't too bad, but what's a little bit more challenging is when we don't say prove something, but rather we just say, okay, estimate a function. So you remember when we said, okay, find the limit as n goes to infinity of x squared sine of 2 over x. And you remember how we did that. We found lower and upper bounds, and then we took the limit on both sides, and we usually found that this was equal to 0. Usually, sorry, this should be as n goes to 0. Well, for this, what we do is we take our function, root x, and we look at our limits. So we know 1 is a lower bound, so we take the root of 1, which is 1, and 4 is going to be our upper bound, so we know that the square root of 4 is 2, and now we just integrate everything. So we're going to have 1 times b minus a is going to be less than the integral of 1 to 4 of root x dx, which will be less than 2 times 4 minus 1, which is b minus a. So what we'll get is that our integral from 1 to 4 of the square root of x dx is going to be between 3 and 6. So of course when you compute this later, you will find that yes, this is the case, and graphically, this should make very, very intuitive sense, because if we know the graph of 
the square root of x, x is 1, x is 4, so we have a 1 and a 2 here. Then we get a graph that looks like this. So if we take our low point here, then we have this area here, and this will be 3, and we'll have another box up here, which encompasses the whole thing, and this will have an area of 6, and we can clearly see that the area underneath this curve here is somewhere between the two values of 3 and 6. So graphically this makes sense. And those are pretty much the final properties of integrals. So now that all this is left, well, all this is done, all that's left to do is figure out how to do integrals algebraically. So we're going to do that next time. But as always, if you have any questions or concerns, just leave them in the comments below and I will get to them as quickly as possible.